So I don't see that, the matrix, as an immediate threat. I also think that this technology is probably going to go through an S-shaped curve. In other words, it's it's come in and it's, it's very impressive and will develop a bit, but it'll then begin to flatten out and won't get significantly better. It will achieve competent mediocrity, perhaps getting slightly better, and that won't systematically replace human employment. So I, I don't see the two most advertised dangers of this, namely world domination and or um, complete job apocalypse as being in the cards at the moment. Hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust. And today we're going to be talking about the controversial subject of artificial intelligence, AI, with a, a senior research fellow of the Federal Trust, Hugh Lawson Tancred. Hugh, welcome. You're also a, a, an honorary research fellow at Birkbeck College, and I know you've written and broadcast a great deal on this subject, particularly in its ethical and political dimension. Uh, but can we, before we start, uh, get some definitional matters cleared up? It, it seems to me that people uh, often use the, the term AI uh, in a very broad sense, and sometimes they mean little more than uh, any operations that are related to algorithms. On other times, they're, they're worried about a malign intelligence that's going to take over the whole universe. Um, can you give us one or two definitions and say what you favour? I said, first of all, thank you very much indeed for working me on board. Um, yes, I mean, okay, so obviously artificial intelligence as such is a pretty broad notion. It will cover something like a pocket calculator. I mean, it, it, machines have been doing, in some sense, intelligent things, things that require intelligence for us for quite a long time. Um, but okay, right now, artificial intelligence means replicating more interesting aspects of human performance, such as using language and indeed scanning a visual scene and spotting objects in a, in a, in a field of sight. Um, uh, we usually distinguish between two ways of doing this. Either you can try and make something which is itself intelligent, or you can somehow or other copy, replicate, piggy bank the, the trail left by human intelligence, particularly in the form of the internet. The internet is a huge corpus of documents produced by intelligent human beings, more or less. Uh, and you can basically spot patterns in that, which enable you, in a sense, to replicate it and extend it, which is what's happening now with things like GPT, this is these generative models. The so-called large language models are essentially doing that. Uh, and it, this can be focused either, and of course, in some way of thinking that this is not proper AI at all, so it's just a kind of ersatz AI. Um, and it can either be focused on a narrow domain, such as spotting protein structures, which is one of the great breakthroughs in narrow AI, or on the more general domain, such as chatting about anything, which ChatGPT and its, its congeners can, can now do. Um, but yeah, that, that's quite an important distinction. Is it, 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 this, is intel this is general intelligence, but not general agency. Uh, that we haven't yet replicated. And that leaves, I think, a crucial role for human beings who, of course, do have agency. Well, that, that leads on to the next area I wanted to discuss, which is the way in which public debate often focuses on the supposed dangers and downsides of, of AI. And I mentioned it uh, at the, already at the extreme, there is a fear uh, of a malign super intelligence taking over the universe. From, from what you said, do you, you think that that's a, a, an overstated fear? I think that sphere is overstated at the moment. I mean, any, any, anybody knowing about this will be cautious. And Jeffrey Hinton, for instance, one of the great gurus of the field, and he resigned from Google in order to warn people about the dangers. He's a kind of Oppenheimer figure um, in this area. So you know, no one can be too confident. But right at the moment, this technology is has no, as I say, no agency, no intrinsic motivation, and certainly doesn't want to dominate the world or do anything else, even the general forms of AI. So I don't see that, the matrix, as an immediate threat. I also think that this technology is probably going to go through an S-shaped curve. In other words, it's, it's coming and it's, it's very impressive and will develop a bit but it'll then begin to flatten out and won't get significantly better it will achieve competent mediocrity perhaps getting slightly better and that won't systematically replace human employment so i i don't see the two most advertised dangers of this namely world domination and or um, complete job apocalypse as being in the cards at the moment with this technology as it stands, it's likely to develop, to develop. It can't really develop much further because to do so, it would need more data, which isn't available. It's already scraped the meaningful internet. Better mathematics, which is not obviously forthcoming, uh, and or simply more, more power, more input, which with quantum might make a difference. But again, that's completely uncertain. So as things currently stand, I don't see this situation changing from the dramatic change which has already occurred. One other danger that people sometimes see is a more uh, a more intangible one, a more general one, um, uh, of uh, of the undermining of of social communication 
um, of, uh, as it were, exacerbating even more the, the tensions and um, problems which are associated with um, social media. Um, do you think that's a, a realistic fear? I think it's an absolutely realistic fear, but it's a fear we already have. I mean, in the area of, of big data, we already have the danger of manipulation of people through social media, the invasions, invasions of privacy, the absolute complete impossibility of being entirely on your own. All that sort of stuff is already present, and we haven't really grappled with it. Though we're starting to do so now. That becomes worse with AI, but not it's, it's not really a quantum change. It's, it's, it's just a change in degree. And similarly with fake news. Already you can have pretty effective fake news and have we've had you know, quite good fakes for quite a long time. Um we now have deep fakes, which are you know, more impressive and more difficult to spot. But the answer to that is some kind of certification. You have to say this is a this is an authentic source, and the chain of transmission is also hasn't been tampered with, which again we understand pretty well how to do. So that I think is, you know, regulators are catching up with that. So I don't see that as a deep insoluble problem. It is certainly a real problem. Yes, and and the role of regulators. Are, are you talking particularly about governments? How, how important is the role of government uh, and other? market participants or social participants in in uh, in moderating or mitigating any possible dangers that might arise from ai yeah i think that the regulatory level can't really happen at the state uh, the, the regulatory function can't happen at the state level i think because this is an in, intrinsically international service i mean on you know online had no state borders so it, it's it's regional and global governance that we need the regions can can govern themselves in certain sort of civil society type issues such as as privacy and, and uh, deep fakes and so on uh, and the, the european union has led the way on that both with the gdpr for conventional data and also now with the ai act which has gone through the parliament for for ai manipulated data and, and that will continue and other regions will have different regulations and that's that's livable with in terms of attitudes to civil society i think should be an american jurisdiction and a chinese jurisdiction most people are falling in you know the brussels effect is happening the, the, most people are falling in pretty much with the the european regulations because of course you can't sell in europe without complying with them and so de facto the european standards in these areas have become the global standards uh, and beyond that, I think in terms of of, of the economic impact, you, you, we need a kind of OECD plus in a sense. We need to expand. You know, friendly countries need to agree on how they're going to use this technology, what impact it's going to have on employment, how we're going to try and maximize the, employment, the benefits for employment and avoid simply you know, transferring the balance of power too far towards capital. Uh, you know, we, we have the presence of globalization, good and bad. Uh, to learn from on this this is globalization on crack in a sense because this means that you know jobs are competed with not only in the rich world by people in the poorer world but also people themselves in the poorer world are now competed with people competed with by things in the even poorer world of the of the ai space so uh, that i think requires talking about and, and a good paradigm of that is this new uh, um, india middle east europe corridor which was just announced at the g20 a week or so ago um yeah, that you... would be the Say a bit more about co collaboration between the regional blocks that you mentioned. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, there are, of course, things like the OECD and, and the IMF, so there, are, there are frameworks for this to happen. But I think that the future I see it is that you will have this kind of interregional agreement on a, some rules of the game. So, you know, from the point of view, the Indians, I mean, they are obviously able to sell, uh, this, you know, they have to exploit their, their labor advantage to sell into Europe. But that is threatened by itself by, as we said, by AI. And so, you know, we need to agree, okay, well, how are we going to benefit, maximize the benefit of this for everybody? Um, and that requires things like the trade and technology councils, which exist between the EU and the US and between the EU and India. Whereas I understand it, I'm no party to them. This stuff is actually thrashed out. People who know what they're talking about <laughs> have them sit down around the table and have, you know, useful arguments when they don't, you know, because everyone doesn't see eye to eye. But, you know, I think that's the way forward to achieving some reasonable degree. So we distribute the, the economic benefits and losses of this better than we did with globalization. Yeah. yeah do you think have... between the three main areas you've mentioned, the European Union, um, the United uh, the United States and China, uh, there are different balances and preferences within those areas that um, uh, are different among themselves. One might favor more privacy, one might favor more economic uh, advance, another might see the role of the state as being primordial. Uh, yes, well, I mean, on that one, the, 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 the Michael Adam Siegel wrote a book called "Hacking the World Order." It's quite an old book now, but I think it still meant pretty true. It's true of the data era and true of the AI era. In that, you know, there are three players: there's the company, there's, there's the companies, there's the state, and there's the individual. Uh, the, the Americans tend to favour the companies. The, the Chinese system heavily favours the state, and the European system courageously champions the individual. 
And that, I think, is also the, the way forward. And I think, you know, under the Biden administration, the Americans have moved closer to being an individual-focused, data-subject-focused approach. And that's the humane way to develop this, in my view. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, so. What about Britain's position, the United Kingdom's position in this? Uh, uh, where do we stand? Uh, I understand that, that um, the United Kingdom has a very favorable and very, very prestigious record and standing w- within the AI um, area. Is that correct? It absolutely is correct. Yes. I mean, uh, we, we could claim to be the sort of progenitors of both computation in general and AI in particular, largely, of course, through Alan Turing, but also also others. So, um, yeah, we have a very good you know, street cred in this area. Absolutely. And of course, there are two things that we could usually try and do. We could, we could try and contribute to regulation, as we've been discussing, or we can contribute to the actual industry of doing making AI and making AI applications of various kinds. Um, <laughs> to deal with the former quickly, I think that, you know, the, of course, there will be this conference in Bletchley Park at the start of November, which is coming up, um, <clears throat> which has been sort of billed as placing Britain as a sort of centre for regulating safe AI, compatible AI. I mean, I'm not sure that's really a legitimate role for Britain. I mean, regulators are either very big and basically own the market anyway, and then they, just, they set the games, and, as happened after the Second World War with the, the IMF and the World Bank, or they're relatively small powers who everybody trusts, such as the Dutch with, with the Hague or the Austrians with, you know, with part of the UN and... and um, the IEA and so on, uh, you know, so uh, we're neither of those. Uh, we're a significant regional power in Europe. I don't see us being a regulatory, having a, our role being regulatory. I see our role as being crucially involved in the European effort, which is still incipient. Europe is well behind China and America and AI, and it's getting its act slowly together. And uh, one, one of the crucial things is that Britain should be clev- clearly and closely involved and integrated into the European regional effort to bring up European AI production to the same level as the Americans and Chinese, which is possible. And with this new alliance with the Indians, we could perhaps loop them in as well as emerging, and, and of course be friendly to the Americans' role and to the Chinese. But that that would be a significant problem. Britain has absolutely no role at going it alone. It's, this is completely unrealistic in our age. That This is one of the sectors in which Britain should get closer, as close as possible to the European Union on in the wake of the horizon. The, you know, well, return to horizon. How important is horizon in this connection? Well, I mean, Horizon has a large, there's, there's a thing called the European Innovation Council, which is kind of part of Horizon, which gets pretty young, I mean, two or three years old. But I mean, yeah, of course, obviously, Horizon realizes that digital innovation is a crucial part of scientific investment. And so there's a large element of that. So uh, the Horizon is vital. I mean, it, it's as in science more generally. So in, in AI, uh, you know, this is a huge injection of money into research. Um, I, it's fair to say, in many ways, that, that, that um, yeah, big science in Europe isn't as well developed as big science in America. And Americans learnt the lesson of the Manhattan Project 70, 80 years ago uh, and deployed it in lots of other things, creating DARPA, creating an effective Silicon Valley. We haven't done that in Europe yet. Um, and yes, there's lots of, you know, the Human Brain Project was a bit of a fiasco. Um, uh, uh, but, um, but I mean, it, we're getting it together. And this, this is vital, obviously, for the future prosperity of Europe and indeed for the future benign evolution of AI in general that is done with European values in a certain sense. Um, and Britain has a key role to play in that. We need to be as integrated as closely as possible. And, you know, we are in this sector of science and technology and with it AI, we are basically rejoining, it seems to me, in practice. And of course, in reality, if not in name. Uh, and that is to be hugely encouraged and pushed further. In my view, that's Britain's role. Yes, yes. So you think that in this particular sector, the the, the damage which um, you've seen and which I think many people have seen of Brexit can be largely mitigated by participation in, in the Horizon programme and by the nature of uh, scientific international cooperation? Uh, yes, it can be mitigated. It can't be entirely restored. It will never be a glad, confident morning again, I'm afraid. We, we've lost a position of huge strength within Europe. We could have been the California and Massachusetts of, of Europe. Uh, we've undermined that. How much it is restored with goodwill and so on and the general closure relationship and eventually rejoining, I mean, th- that's an open question. But we can certainly still still a lot to fight for. There's still a lot to save. And we still have a big, big, big players in the emerging European AI scene, uh, despite Brexit. Yes. Good. Uh Finally, um, we began by talking about dangers, and understandably, those have, have much been uh, to the fore in the public debate. Um, can we conclude by talking about the benefits, about the the, uh, the unalloyedly good aspects of, uh, of artificial intelligence? 
I'm delighted to do that because <laughs> they tend to get forgotten, in, in, you know, because of our concerns about this, rightly. But I mean, the benefits are absolutely enormous. The problems we face in the modern world are essentially problems of complexity. What AI does, in both its general and particularly in its narrow form, is address complexity in the way that the microscope address, address, address the very small and the telescope address the very far away, the very, the very large. Uh, yeah, and, and that's a cru crucial breakthrough. I mean, the, the, the protein folding, you know, the alpha folds analysis of protein folding, just in a nutshell, is is a paradigm of how this could work. Like proteins are tiny objects, they know scale, and incredibly complicated book bundles of wool. If you know how the bundles of wool are structured, this will explain what they do, which is what runs everything in, in living beings, including ourselves. Um, and, you know, people have spent a lot of time with very clever device, systems trying to figure that out. But it took a lot of labor, a lot of time. Max Perot spent his entire career working out the structure of hemoglobin. All this can now just be done <laughs> by plugging into the application and doing this in, in moments. And it's already happening. People are beginning to use this, for instance, treatment of malaria. So people are already beginning to use this understanding of protein structure to make major changes in, in life sciences and healthcare. And that I see expanding and developing and you know, in due course, eliminating human disease or animal disease. Yeah. Um, and so the benefits are limited. And Max Tegmark, the physicist turned kind of guru, uh, talks about life three, life as been unable to change it's either hardware or software for billions of years so then we came along and started changing the software by changing our culture now we can also change our own hardware in various ways. and the prospects of consequences that are more or less limitless so yes there's a huge upbeat there are sunny uplands yeah. and, and, and how will we ensure that um, the sunny uplands are equitably distributed between all sections of society well, that is the question of the 21st century. <laughs> my view. However, the one answer, part of the answer, is maximizing the role of the European Union, which has proven its ability to regulate in the interests of its citizens. And that should be continued and expanded with our cooperation and vigorous involvement. Good. Well, that's a, a message that the Federal Trust is always very happy to be associated with. Thank you very much, Hugh. Very illuminating. And uh, uh, it was so clear and accessible that I'm sure all our viewers will be very grateful to you. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you.